these uh, directories uh, are described by an index file. You will find a list of all the contents of each directory inside this index file. And this will help you navigate and select the data that uh, you are, in, are interested in. Um, one last technical uh, slide is how the files are named. We, are try we have tried to make it uh, easier for the users to find a specific platform. So we, use, we are using some uh, uh, codes, some diagrams. The first diagram is the region that has uh, um, collected this data and is, is distributing this data. The second diagram describes the file type, if it is a time series, if it is a profile, or total or radial velocities for its HF radars, or uh, wave spectral data. The third diagram is the data type, if it is a mooring, if it is a ferry box, a bottle data. And the fourth one is the unique identification of the platform. It's a code that is used, and with this code, you will find this platform within Copernicus Marine Service. The last one indicates the date for the latest and the monthly files, which are separated per day inside the FTP service. And for history, we usually don't use a suffix, but when something is used, it's usually to describe the time sampling or some difference, specific difference on this platform regarding a similar one with a similar code. Uh, so, uh, a second way to access the data is through our website, marinecity.eu, um, where you can click on the dashboard here and you will view all the in situ data. The default, the default view is uh, a view of all the data that uh, are operating within the latest 30 days. And you can filter out which platforms you would like to see and search for a specific platform or uh, to check per category or per parameters. You can play with this and check what is available in the area. And uh, for each platform, you can click on this uh, uh, map and uh, you will find some extra information. And uh, you can both view the latest data with some graphics representation here, or even download the data of the specific platform by providing you a list of the files that are available inside the FTP. This will lead you to the FTP. This will download the files directly from the FTP, but without needing the full directory of the Copernicus Marine Service. So apart from these services, we also provide all the documentation needed to understand the data and understand what uh, processing or quality control has been applied on them. And uh, you will also find some useful code on how to open CDF files and how to uh, process all this data. Uh, we also are providing some monitoring on uh, what we are providing, how are uh, uh, these data distributed. We'll find some delay on the arrival uh, on uh, uh, the Copernicus Marine Service, the number of platforms that are available inside the service, the data quality, uh, some information on the data providers and the, the data files in general. And uh, another service that we're also providing for our data, pro data providers, we have collected uh, some statistics on how uh, users are uh, uh, downloading uh, uh, these data. Uh, so a data provider can check uh, on uh, their platforms and their statistics and uh, find more information and use this information also uh, in order to advertise uh, their work that they are doing. So on uh, my next slide, um, I wanted also to provide some information for um, any provide data provider that might might have some data on the regions around Africa that they would like to share with Copernicus Marine Service in the NITC2 component. Uh, so I have highlighted some emails here, uh, which you can use to contact, to come uh, in contact with us and share your data or uh, make some suggestion on missing data that you cannot find inside Copernicus Marine Service. And we can work on this in order to uh, provide and extend more data in this repository. 
on uh, my last uh, slide now, I would like um, to add some information about some future evol evolution that will uh, happen on all this uh, data. Uh, we are planning to make some changes on the uh, NetCDF files and the attributes that are used in order to follow CF conventions, which is a standard that provides fair da data. And uh, we are um, we are going to be using the discrete sampling geometries. This is quite technical, but for those who are using uh, this data from uh, next November, there will be some slight differences on uh, the way that uh, the data are provided. So uh, have this in mind as well, that uh, a change is going to happen uh, within the next months. So this is it for me. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your, for your presentation. <laughs> um, I learned a lot. I, that's what I love about these workshops. I always learn something. <laughs> Um, let's see if we have some questions for you. <laughs> okay, there is no, Sorry, Vincent, do you want to go? There is no questions so far. Oh, yes, we do have. You can share your screen. Uh, oh. oh, yeah. I'm going to stop my screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, if I share my screen. So first, there is general, general questions concerning uh, uh, the, the recording and the, the material you you will have after after the, the, the two session workshop. So don't be worried, the session is recorded, okay? So you will have all the session replay available on the material link, which is called the Padlet, okay? We will share the link many times during the, the session uh, on the chat, on the chat box. So everything is centralized on the Padlet, the material link, okay? So don't be worried. You will have plenty of time to 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 watch the replays and uh, and to have uh, the the presentation of the lectures. Exactly. So, <laughs> Andrea, if you can read the next question. Yeah, of course. Um, so the next question is a bit uh, broad <laughs> and might be a bit hard to answer, and maybe also not necessarily for you, Maria. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Maybe our next uh, speakers uh, can address it more. So, uh, as I understand, you you're not so experienced with the Africa, African, African, uh, uh, yeah, exactly context, no, right? No, no. Yeah, exactly. So um, yes, I will not be able get, to answer this. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it's also quite broad. Um, um, yeah, let's. Uh, uh, we will save it for now. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, and. Did we already, uh, so another one is, uh, did we already have in situ data coming for Copernicus near the coast of Central Africa? Um, as you have seen from the snapshot I had in my uh, uh, presentation, there are some data uh, close uh, to the Africa coasts, but um, I believe that there are a lot of more missing and um, we would like uh, to also make this request here that um, if you have all you know of uh, institutions or uh, uh, operators who uh, operate uh, any platform near the coast, please contact us and let us come in contact with uh, them or with you if, it's, if you are one of them. And uh, we would be very happy to uh, try and degrade all these data. Uh, I have also to comment here that um, uh, we have developed the service uh, where we can uh, integrate data from any kind of format. Uh, so uh, you don't need to uh, make the, harmon the harmonization that is needed within Copernicus. We undertake this role to uh, receive the data within any format that is uh, available and we um, harmonize it and we make this the needed changes in the naming not on the data we don't change anything on the data provided and uh, we are uh, uh, formatting them into NCDF files and distribute them inside Copernicus Marine and also due to the collaboration with, uh, we have with other uh, initiatives we also distribute this data into MONET and uh, uh, other repositories who are uh, providing in situ data to the community. Great, thank you. 
I guess that uh, answers a bit uh, also this uh, next question. Uh, the distribution map of the ocean data that sub-Saharan African is not covered. Only Northern mm -hmm. Africa is covered, yeah. That covers uh, a bit that. Yes, and even Northern Africa is uh, really scarce. So okay. we have a lot of uh, information and data which covers uh, uh, the northern and central Mediterranean, but uh, for the southern part of Mediterranean, we have uh, very little information, very little data to see with right now. There's an opportunity there then. Yes. yes. Great. Uh, uh, yeah. Andrea, Sorry, if, you, go. if you don't mind, we, we are running a little bit late. So yes, we are. <laughs> we keep all the questions unanswered and we will provide all answers to the to those questions on the Padlets. So don't be worried. Yeah? All the questions you will ask will be answered afterwards. But we have a uh, we have, we can have one. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, we have so thank you very much, Maria. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> okay, and now we will um, introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, there is uh, Marine Bretagnon uh, and Antoine Majan, if he is here as well. Uh, otherwise, Marine Bretagnon. Yes, uh, I was going to tell us a bit more. Yes, good morning. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, Marine is going to tell us about uh, the uh, global um, satellite ocean color products. Um, so the floor is yours, uh, Marine. Whenever you you want, you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Um, okay. Can Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, then, good morning, everybody. I am Marine Bretagnon from uh, AcriST, and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about the ocean products which are delivered uh, by uh, the Copernicus Marine Platforms. Uh, because actually, we are um, delivered for uh, Copernicus as uh, a global, um, the, glo the ocean color for the global oceans. So, First, um, I just would like to make a kind of reminder about uh, the remote sensing and why remote sensing. Actually, uh, satellites offer um, a synoptic view of the ocean and allow to document the physics and the biology of the biogeochemistry of the ocean uh, routinely. Actually, even offshore regions or polar regions uh, where we can have some difficulties to, ask to, to have in situ measurements, we can, thanks to satellite data, uh, have a, a kind of a remote uh, monitoring of this particular area. Since uh, the 80s and the sensor, which were called a uh, coastal zone color scanner, CZCS, which was a proof of concept, the ocean color measurements from space uh, were uh, was uh, defined as a powerful tool allowing us to improve our understanding of the ocean on every scale thanks to an archive uh, of daily images. Um, now, actually, with the international cooperation between the NASA and the ESA, we have uh, a succession of ocean color uh, first, uh, sea waves in uh, 1987, then Modis, Meris, Virs, and now, more recently, with a European effort in the frame of the Copernicus program and the development of the all sea uh, sensor, we have an, an archive, a continuous archive of more than 20 years of data, which, has, which is uh, actually freely uh, available. Uh, then a few words on the principle of the ocean colors. Um, the measurement of the ocean color actually is a passive method uh, that, um, that means that satellites uh, measure, measures part of the electro electromagnetic energy which is emitted by the sunlight and, tra and transmitted through the atmosphere and reflected back towards the Earth, uh, enfin, uh, toward, uh, toward uh, the, the, the satellite. So first, the sunlight uh, reaches the surface, uh, which this is called the downwelling irradiance. I don't know if you can see my uh, my uh, point pointer here. Uh, this is a yes, we can. perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
this is the downwelling irradiance. Uh, the sunlight reach uh, the sea surface, and then um, a part of the light is uh, absorbed in function of the, the particles, and a part of uh, the light is scattered in uh, all the directions. And among other uh, direction go uh, so uh, up to the atmosphere and get back to the satellite, and uh, which uh, this is named the water leaving irradiance. Um, we actually we work usually with the reflectant with uh, reflectances, which is the ratio between uh, the water leaving radiance and uh, the downwelling irradiance. Uh, so we said previously that the quanti sorry, quantity of the light which is, which is uh, received by the satellite is a uh, is function of the composition of the composition composition of the seawater, and uh, so you have uh, more or less a, a, a representation of uh, of this on this uh, on this uh, small figure here on the left. Um, the particles, uh, the properties of the particles which are present into the water and their concentration will lead uh, to light absorption or scattering. As optically active constituent, we we constituent we can we can list uh, the water absorption, the color or chromos chromophoric chromophoric dissolved materials, uh, non phytoplankton particles, inorganic particles, and uh, phytoplankton as well. Um, and yes, so the, you will have actually uh, you can see for instance the phytoplankton when you are, when you will have a higher concentration of phytoplankton the uh, the 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 ocean color will be more blue or green and as soon as you have uh, sediment or other particles you will have. Uh, uh, ocean color, which is more brown or yellow. Uh, so you can access all these products thanks to the Copernicus Marine Service. And um, you can, uh, for the ocean color data, you have two types of products. You have the purely optical products, which, uh, which are listed here in blue. For the... Um, uh, and the, what we call the biogeochemical products here in grid, um, which are actually deri uh, deri derived from the optical product and which can also be fine, which can be used as a product, but also as an ocean monitoring indicator, which is actually an indicator of the health of the ecosystems. Uh, in this talk, we will focus uh, mainly on the products, optical and uh, geochemical, and we will not talk too much of uh, ocean monitoring uh, indicators, but if you have any question, uh, I can uh, answer. So first, uh, on the uh, optical product, as we see before, the reflectances correspond to the ratio between the upwelling irradiance and the downwelling irradiance. The upwelling irradiance is directly affected by the seawater composition, as you can see on uh, these two pictures. When the water is clear, or when you have uh, mainly low concentration of phytoplankton, the spectrum of, 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 the, radi uh, of the radiance have the shape represented on the, on the left. Mm. Conversely, when you have uh, not a lot of phytoplankton, or when you have a lot of inorganic particles, as for instance in survivor plume, you will have uh, a water, as we said before, uh, which is more brown or yellow, uh, and then the, the spectrum of the reflectance will be like this. Uh, now we will go in more details on the other optical products. Uh, one of the two first images on the uh, on the top left, this one and this one, uh, are represented for the diffuse attenuation and then the secchi depth tra transparency. Oops, sorry. Um, these two parameters indicate how deep uh, the light penetrates the, oce the ocean. In coastal regions, due to the loading in particles, the light penetrates penetrate only on few meters and sometimes centimeters. Conversely, offshore, the layer in which the light penetrates uh, is deeper. Uh, 
We should here underline that the sickness regulates the physics and the biology of the oceans. For the physical part, uh, this thickness uh, governs the convective circulation and the, for the biological part, this indicates the layer in which phytoplankton can grow. The, op uh, the other parameters which are listed are the suspended mat um, uh, particle matter, and which indicate the concentration in sentiment particles. Uh, you have also the particulate back back backscattering coefficient, the BBP. This parameter is also uh, an important one, as for instance, in the open ocean, it can be related to the concentration of particulate organic carbon. This is then an important parameter for the estimation of the biological carbon pump and then all the uh, study about the climate change. And finally, on this uh, small uh, picture, you have also um, the color dissolved matter, which uh, which is an indicator of the degradation of the organic matter, and is uh, often is an indicator which uh, which is often named as a, an indicator of uh, detritus concentration. So that is for the optical products, and we will now have a look on biological products, and particularly uh, actually on the products which are named on uh, as uh, plankton on the Copernicus Marine uh, Service. Uh, so here you have uh, two pictures. The first one is the chlorophyll A concentration, and the second one is the uh, primary production uh, biomass. Um, Actually, uh, to monitor the phytoplankton concentration is very important because um, it, the phytoplankton is at the basis of the marine food web. In area uh, biologically active, for instance, in France, where you have uh, an accumulation of phytoplankton, we can suspect uh, uh, hot spots for a fish concentration. Conversely, when the concentration of, of phytoplankton is uh, very, very high, this indicates potentially uh, eutrophication events and potentially uh, led to the death of the environment. So uh, actually to monitor this, uh, this parameter, the chlorophyll, uh, this we are lucky because the photosynthesis use uh, the chlorophyll A pigment, which is optically active. Um, this pigment absorbs blue and red light and then uh, colors the water in green. So the phytoplankton concentration can be assessed, assessed uh, thanks to the chlorophyll concentration. In parallel to the chlorophyll concentration, we have the primary production, which can be derived uh, from satellite observation of chlorophyll, of course, but also from sea surface temperature, which is also an, esti which is, uh, an estimate of the rate of the production. Uh, when you have uh, warmer water, you will have potentially uh, uh, higher production. And you need also the photosynthetically available radiation, which is actually uh, the quantity of light available for the photosynthesis. Uh, on the two maps, uh, on the left, you also presented uh, uh, actually two specific events. Um, you have a high productivity in the opening of Mauritania and also a productivity, a high productivity in the, uh, in the Congo plume. You can see this, uh, these features actually on the two maps for the chlorophyll and also for the primary, pr primary production maps. So actually, thanks to the com pigment composition, we do not have access only on the chlorophyll concentration, but also on, um, we can get a little bit more information on the biological composition of the seawater. We will focus now on what we call the PFT and the PSC. So uh, in few words uh, the defi um, of the definition, uh, the PFT stands for phytoplankton functional types. This represents some phytoplankton groups which share the same functionality. For example, for example, we can list uh, the nitrogen fixers, the calcifiers, the production, the producer of uh, dimethyl sulfide, DMS uh, producers, uh, and the uh, silicifier, uh, for instance, uh, like uh, the diatoms. But we talk about also the PSC, 
for phytoplankton size classes, which regroups phytoplankton cells in function of their size. And actually, it's really interesting to see that uh, the satellite, which has, uh, which are uh, at more than, uh, at uh, several uh, hundred of kilometers from the sea, which uh, are able to see uh, cells which are very very small, as you can see, uh, about uh, ten uh, micrometers. So, uh, uh, how can we differentiate them? Um, we can different uh, we can differentiate all the the the, the PFT uh, thanks to their pigment composition. We have seen previously that the phytoplankton are composed of chlor of chlorophyll, but in function of the species, the pigment composition is not the same. You will have chlorophyll, but also other pigment, for instance the car car carotenoid, uh, and this will lead to different colors uh, of the of the water, as you can see on the bottle on the left. In function of the phytoplankton types, you will have different colors. Uh, you can access to the different PFT and PST from the Copernicus platform. And as you can see us on this uh, map, on this example, you will have, for instance, a bloom of uh, haptophytes uh, in the upwelling of, of Bengala. So briefly, to sum up in terms of spatial and temporal resolutions, uh, available on the Copernicus Marine uh, Service. You have uh, several resolution. Uh, at the European level, the data are, uh, uh, um, are delivered at one kilometer and even 300 meters resolution for the data from uh, for, uh, from the all three sensors. Uh, that means uh, that the 300 meters resolution will be available since uh, 20. 16. From a temporal uh, point of view, the data are delivered on a daily basis, uh, but also on monthly basis and also an annual integration time. For the global ocean, uh, the, the resolution is uh, 4 km and still at the, in the coastal ocean, in the coastal waters, you will have a uh, a resolution of 300 meters. Uh, the temporal resolution are the same than uh, for the European, uh, uh, the European scale. Uh, what can be also uh, an, inter an interesting thing is the possibility to access to an interpolated product uh, called a, a gap-free product, L4, uh, which uh, which allow to benefit uh, of uh, maps without uh, clouds. Because as we said, actually, ocean color is uh, what we call passive uh, passive uh, remote sensing. So when you will have cloud, glint, glint or other um, atmospheric parameter, you will not have uh, data. But here, thanks to this L4 product, you will, uh, will have uh, a daily map, which is uh, more or less uh, complete. Um, another interesting thing is uh, from a user point of view is the documentation made available thanks to the Copernicus Marine Service. We can find there information uh, on the quality and uh, on, of the product and the validations in the quid, but also on the way to download and help uh, in the use of the product thanks to the product user manual. And then I would like to conclude on the benefits we can retrieve from the ocean color observations. Um, we discussed a little bit uh, about that uh, before, but uh, we say that the chlorophyll concentration is a proxy of the biomass of uh, marine plants or phytoplankton, but uh, this help uh, for fisheries. We have uh, also the information uh, about uh, sediment transports we can also have information of uh, the disper dispersion of pollutants. So actually, yes, ocean color um, deliver a lot of information what we can be used on different, uh, for different uh, issues or different studies uh, and different topics. Let's say. Uh, thank you very much for your listening. And if you have any questions.
Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Marine, um, for your presentation. Um, we unfortunately we wouldn't have uh, time to answer all the questions. Uh, we certainly had a lot of questions for you, um, but we will uh, ask you one. We will share one of the questions with you, um, and uh, after and the, all the questions uh, will be answered uh, by our experts and will be made available in the platforms we already shared. We will we share the links to these platforms, and don't worry, you will get the answers to your um, answers. Um, so I will. Sorry. I would like as well to ask uh, to add uh, uh, one thing because mm -hmm. I see a lot of exchanges of contacts in, in the chat. Do not hesitate to use your pinio location uh, software in the Padlet where you can uh, pin your location and give some inform information, contact, email, etc. etc. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Okay, yeah. Um, if Marine, you could stop sharing your screen, so yes. I will thank you. Um, great, and now I will share one question and say present and oops. Um, okay, so I've seen this one. I work in near shore coral reef environments. Are the ocean colored products corrected to address potential issues caused by bottom reflectance in near shore system? Um, I think it's depend of the of the products that you use. Uh, effecti um, actually, we actu it it will be a little bit more difficult in uh, in coastal waters uh, because uh, yes, of the the shallow waters. Actually, the ocean color are affected also by by the by the by the the the, 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 the depths actually mm -hmm. uh, by the sediment at the at the the biography yeah but yes by yeah. the bottom uh so but uh, there are several studies about that and that's why actually we we are developing the the, the 300 meters resolution actually if you want to use uh, the four kilometers it will uh, will not potentially not answer your your question but if you use um the reflectances at uh, 300 meters i think you can uh, you can address uh, some question uh, and particular issues on uh, on these uh, particular systems Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marine. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for the moment. <laughs> Thank you for Thank your you. presentation. <laughs> and um, now quickly, we will pass uh, to our next uh, speaker, who's uh, Andrea Pisano from CNR, and he's going to tell us uh, more about the, um, the sea surface temperature satellite products. The floor is yours whenever you want, Andrea. Yes. Here I am. So you, you you can see the screen. I can. Is that okay? Okay. Um, well, could, good morning. You put, uh, sorry, you can put it in presentation mode if you. Yeah. Oh, great. You were already doing okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> good morning to all of you. I am Andrea Pisano, researcher uh, at the Institute of Marine Sciences, based in Rome and presently leading the sea surface temperature tack. And uh, I prepare this talk with the objective to give you some very basic elements and, com and concepts about SST that could help you in exploring the Copernicus SST catalog and choose the SST product that best fits uh, your needs. Uh, um, a very brief introduction of the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, this is the marine component of the European Copernicus program, uh, which is in charge of the provision of regular, systematic and state-of-the-art uh, ocean data covering the global ocean and the European regional seas. Uh, sorry, it is composed by uh, seven MFCs that provide model data only, so forecasting data, and eight tags that provide observation based data. Tags uh, are uh, organized by ocean variables such as wind, sea level, wave, and so on. Uh, 
uh, and our data are primary primary base on satellite satellite and in situ uh, in measurements. Uh, uh, so my talk focuses uh, on the SST TAC, which is in charge of the near real time and multi year SST uh, production. Uh, what about satellite observations? Uh, uh, a few words. Well, first of all, uh, satellites have the unique capability to provide a synoptic, regular, and systematic mapping of the main essential ocean variable, as well as essential climate variable, at the global scale. This means, for example, that satellites uh, can, uh, uh, can map the global SST uh, up to twice per day. Uh, satellite data are uh, very accurate. Um, for example, the accuracy of SST can reach up to one tenth degree. And we have now the possibility to have near real time and multi year satellite data. What does it mean? Real time means uh, that, as for example, SST data can be uh, available just a few hours uh, after the satellite measurements. Uh, while multi-year data provides um, long-term historical data records uh, covering from 10 to 45 years. Uh, and these is, uh, are useful for climate uh, applications. So remember, real time and multi year. These are one of the key words uh, to remember. Uh, focusing on uh, SST, uh, uh, there are different types uh, of uh, satellite SST uh, data. Uh, you, will you will find in the Copernicus catalog uh, level 3S and level 4 data. What does it mean? A level 3S is simply a daily mean map of SST obtained by several and different satellites in order to reach the highest and widest spatial uh, coverage. Uh, as you can see, as I already said in previous presentation, uh, these types of data are usually affected by data voids since infrared sensor upon which SSD is measured do not see through clouds. So the next level is the level four, which is a gap free, so no data voids. And it might be more useful from a user perspective. Uh, I uh, remind you, recommend you to see the GRIS definition at the following link, link uh, to better to um, uh, uh, better to have more information about uh, the SST levels, the different levels. Uh, there are also different definitions of SST, mainly depending on the instruments uh, used to measure it. Uh, you uh, can find in the catalog the following uh, types of naming, naming uh, skin, SST, subskin, depth, and foundation. The skin SST is the temperature measured by infrared sensor, and it is representative of a mean depth of between 10 to 20 micro microns from the surface. Just below the skin, we have the subskin, and it is the temperature measured by microwave sensor, and it is representative of a depth of about one millimeter from the sea surface. The depth SST is the SST measured at a given depth, for example, 20 centimeter, like this CCI product, and typically measured sensed by in situ instrument. And lastly, and more important, the foundation SST 
representative of 10 meter from the sea surface and it is the temperature free or nearly free of the urinal warming. Uh, overall, during night, the difference between uh, the foundation and the skin is uh, about minus 0.3 degree. Not so much, but during daytime, uh, this is the same plot, uh, but during daytime on the left hand side, the difference between foundation and skin can reach four to five degrees. Remember that foundation doesn't change because is, it is not impacted by the diurnal warming, mainly driven by solar heating. Uh, again, uh, you can consult the uh, website of the Greece for uh, all these uh, information. Uh, the Copernicus SST uh, catalog. So uh, this catalog offers uh, global and regional SST products. Uh, each product, either global or regional, is provided as near real time and multi-year. Near real time means that data, SSD data, uh, cover the last two years uh, up to one day before real time, while multi-year cover the period from 1982 up to six months before real time. Near real time and multi year as provided as level four and level 3S data. Uh, the main difference uh, between real time and multi year is the following that near real time are mainly taught for operational application, while the multi year for climate applications. So, overall, each SST products provides an daily mean map of the foundation SSD at a given spatial resolution, depending on the product. More recently, uh, we added hourly mean maps of the skin and subskin SSD. This means that for every day, uh, you have 24 hourly mean maps. Detailed information about each product is reported in the corresponding POOM and QUINT. The main difference between a global and regional product is that the regional are particularly suited for the specific regional sea. So if you are interested, for example, in the Mediterranean Sea, in the, because you are in the north, uh, interested in the north coast of Africa, my suggestion is to use the Mediterranean Sea product, otherwise the global one. An important thing is that due to Brexit, uh, some of the global SST products are frozen since the data producer, the UK Met Office, is no more part of this consortium. Um, okay, uh, now a few uh, examples of the, 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 the main global products. Let me start with the Ostia Global Product Suite. Ostia is uh, uh, one of the uh, main uh, and widely known global products uh, includes uh, uh, actually currently includes three products, Ostia Near Real Time, Ostia Rep and Ostia Diurnal. Um, Ostia Near Real Time is in practice provides uh, daily global uh, level four or gap free maps of the foundation SST at uh, five kilometer resolution and covering the period from 2007 up to present. Uh, uh, the main variables are the analyzed SST or foundation SST, analysis error, CIS fraction, and mask. Uh, remember that uh, these variables are the same for all the SST products, either global or regional. 
can be useful the analysis error map, which uh, gives you an estimate of the SST error. On average, this product has an error less than half degree. Uh, the Ostia Rep and ISA CCI SST products are the multi ER version of Ostia, uh, thus covering a longer period from 1982 to present, to six months before real time, uh, at the same spatial resolution, five degree. Uh, However, as I said, uh, due to Brexit, these products, uh, Ostia Rep, ISA CCI, and also the Ostia Diurnal product, uh, are now frozen. But we are replacing this product with, uh, with other. While Ostia near real time, it is an, I mean, the, the provision is ensured until the end of 2024. Uh, Odyssea. Odyssea is a new global near real time products that replaces the Ostia one. Uh, it is very similar to Ostia. Uh, um, basically, it provides daily global level four maps, level four and level three S maps of the foundation SST. Uh, at 10 kilometer spatial resolution. Uh, the temporal coverage span from uh, 2021 to present for the level four, while from 2016 to present for the level 3S. The format is NetCDF and is the same file format for all uh, for all this product the SST products um, now just to give you uh, some uh, uh, applications examples uh, let me start with the uh, multi year products uh, all these products uh, are very uh, accurate uh, and long enough uh, to uh, be used for climate and variability studies. Uh, as an example, by using Ostia Rep, you can uh, provide, you can build a, a spatial map of the, of the sea surface temperature trends. In this case, the temporal coverage uh, spans from 1993 to 2021. Uh, similarly, uh, you can uh, uh, build uh, um, spatially, spatially averaged SST uh, time series of anomalies. Uh, and also use this data to uh, provide climate indexes such as El Nino 3.4. Uh, 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 I built this index by using the global uh, ISA CCI products uh, by uh, spanning the, the, the temporal period from 1982 to 2018. Uh, again, uh, you can use uh, multi-year products to uh, evaluate extremes uh, such as marine heat waves. Uh, in this case, I use uh, the ISA CCI product uh, covering the same period, 1982 to 2018, uh, to estimate some of the main properties of marine heat wave. And you can see uh, the mean intensity in terms of um, temperature anomalies, uh, the mean duration and the mean frequency at the global scale. Uh, finally, uh, you can use uh, uh, near real time data uh, to, uh, to have a 
daily monitoring uh, of SST uh, processes. Uh, uh, for example, in these uh, beautiful images, uh, uh, the Benguela upwelling system is well captured by uh, uh, daily uh, images provided by Ostia, uh, as well as it is well visible, the uh, Agulas current and the warm uh, eddies and fronts. Uh, similarly, this is uh, another Ostia daily file corresponding to the day 11 se September 2007, where the uh, Morocco upwelling uh, system is uh, well uh, captured, represented by uh, this uh, uh, SST uh, data. Uh, I Remember, you are recalling you that to, to not forget also the, uh, the regional data, also because, uh, for example, the Mediterranean Sea data uh, are, are provided at one kilometer resolution. So uh, uh, this is my last slide with some useful uh, references. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> it's a uh, it's so much information, but very interesting. It's a bit we we are so short on time, <laughs> um, yeah. and I could see that from, by the questions. And we also have quite a few questions for you, but we'll keep it to one. <laughs> um, so if you stop sharing your screen now, will, um, yes, of course. Okay. Thanks. Um, da -da 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 -da. And the question I have for you is, sorry, this takes a bit of time. Um, oops, no, not this one, present. Um, daily satellite and in-situ measurements of sea surface temperature have differences in calculated skewness and cortices measures. Any idea how to improve the matching uh, satellite data versus in-situ data? Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, I mean, uh, I do not understand very well the question. Uh, I can say that uh, uh, most uh, of, of all uh, the SST data are based on satellite data only. So now in situ measurements mm. are used. Okay. Okay. So I guess uh, really in C two data are used uh, for, but mainly for validation purposes. Great, thank you. Um, and um, I guess that's all we have time for. <laughs> Sorry, but we will um, kindly, if you could kindly answer um, the questions, we uh, have uh, saved them all. And um, afterwards, if you could, uh, I will send you all an email for to get uh, the yes, answers. Yes, of course. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we'll now pass to uh, our next speaker. And this will be our uh, last presentation uh, for the satellite products. Um, Susanna Bell Olivier uh, is going to tell us a bit more about the wave products, satellite wave products. The floor is yours, Annabel, whenever you want. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Loud and clear. Yeah. Can you see my screen properly? As well, yes. Uh, maybe good. there is this. Uh, okay. Um, remove this. Okay, um, hello everybody. I'm very glad to be here. I will uh, talk to you about the satellite uh, observing waves, ocean waves uh, in, the, in the CMEMS uh, catalog. I will talk with you on behalf of the WaveTAC team. Uh, so, so what um, what waves uh, observation for satellites are for? Well, depending on the products, so you can. Uh, there are several applications that can be addressed. It uh, it can be useful to, to study the coastal and the lagoon studies, uh, to to study also extreme events, 
uh, current and waves interactions, and also to analyze mixed seas uh, and to, to understand it better. So I will not go into details um, um, into, into what is on the CMEMS platform, as everybody said before, and as for other variables uh, on the CMEMS platform, you will find uh, easy to use homogeneous net CTF products with uh, associated product user manuals, quality reports, and K performance indicator. Um, the, 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 the strengths of, uh, of CMEMS is really to homogenize all this and to make it as uh, convenient for the users as possible. But I will talk a, a little bit of uh, uh, the, the different approaches you can have from the product. So what, um, what you, you will find in the catalog uh, can address different kind of things. So you can use the satellite observation for validation or assimilation in the models, or you can also look at the data for themselves from the satellite. For both, you can either look at real, uh, near real time uh, data for prediction, for instance, or multi year for, uh, for instance, climate studies. So, to, to give you an example, you will see in, in the catalog um, three types of uh, near real time data sets. So, the, um, the satellite uh, waves are all observed. Um, with two types of satellites. One type is the altimetry. Uh, so they are satellites that go all over the, the world uh, with a repetitivity of 10 or 13 days, depending on the missions. Uh, so currently you have all those eight missions uh, flying all together, uh, seven missions, sorry. Um, and um, and so you, you have this, uh, this um, the along track data that are available within uh, three hours. You also have a daily, uh, daily means if it's more convenient for you, and also gridded uh, products. So depending on, the, on your use, you may want to have something homogeneous or maybe something more precise going exactly under the track of the satellite. Um, if you want to look at the past, and if you want to, to, to look at a long-term long um, series, uh, CMEMS valorize also the, 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 the result from uh, an ESA project called the CCIC state project for climate scale application. And here you will have um, more than 10 missions uh, homogenized and calibrated for more than 25 year, five years. So these are um, uh, multi-year products. And, and you can see, uh, uh, for instance, the trends uh, of uh, uh, how the waves have been um, behave, behaving uh, during the, the, the 20 last years. Uh, this way, you, you can also make some maps and uh, observe how, uh, how it behaves uh, compared to, to what is seen with the models, for instance, or with the reanalysis. Uh, the observations have more noise, but are also more uh, precise and uh, have a, um, a better um, uh, resolution. So, um, so yeah. Um, now, let me just tell you about the two kind of products that you will you will be able to to find either in NRT and delay time. We have two, two type of products that exist uh, for different, from different instruments and missions. The Nadir data that I've been talking to you uh, before. So they are a long track altimeter that only give one value concerning the characterization of waves. Uh, it's significant wave height called uh, SWH. And it will tell you uh, if there is a lot of waves or not a lot of waves. So it's it's the the sea is probably rough or not rough. But the um, the the other type of data gives a spectral content of the data, and this is uh, more um, it, it characterizes the the sea state more finely. I will explain you a, a bit more about this because this is maybe less um, uh, uh, intuitive. 
uh, first of all, uh, you have to understand that waves in the oceans are uh, are, uh, are developing thanks to the wind that forces, and uh, you you have some kind of seas which are wind seas, and some kind of seas which are more large swell. So you, it's different uh, different types of swell and of uh, um, uh, uh, dynamic of the oceans. Well, the nadir uh, data and the, the along track data that are available in CMEMS gives the total energy of this. But uh, if if you want uh, to look at the other kind of uh, of product, the SPC, then it's a spectral information, and it gives you uh, it will tell you, for instance, if you have wind seas and and swell, for instance. So. This is a, a spectral in information of the of the data. So you can see the, the, the red color gives you where there is a lot of energy. So this means that there is a swell, a large swell uh, coming from the northeast. And, and this uh, energy here tells that there is a wind sea coming from the northwest. So this is very rich information. It, uh, you see, uh, it, it, at the very ex, uh, outside of the of the spectra, you have the information of wind wave, and uh, in the middle, it's more the very smooth swell with a long wavelengths uh, above uh, from uh, 500 meters, and in me, in between, you will have some uh, maybe mixed seas. So this is a very rich uh, rich information that can be used. Globally, the, 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 the seas are not um, everywhere. The, the, the main occurrence uh, in the oceans are mixed seas. You can see here the, the occurrence and the, the number of occurrence of mixed seas. Uh, so it's uh, uh, here it's uh, more than 90% of the time it's mixed, mixed, mixed seas. Um, you can have also some, some areas where they are, no, so sorry, wind seas, sorry. These are mixed seas, and these are very large swells in, uh, in, in, in PERP. So uh, depending on what you want to, to look at, uh, you, you will see that the, the waves do not behave the same. And in CMEMS uh, catalog, you will have this information of swell uh, propagated outside from the along track, um, along track data. So when there is a storm somewhere, uh, we, you, we know that it will activate uh, spheric waves that will uh, propagate al uh, across the oceans and um, with, uh, with uh, strands and uh, wavelengths that will uh, vary in time. So, um, so this is built, th these are the L3 CMEMS products. And they are built with Sentinel-1 data, which is a star imaging uh, data. And we also have, since uh, since uh, since two years, information of CFOSAT, which is a, a satellite dedicated to the observation of waves and, more specifically, of wave spectra. Um, yeah. So, so. Uh, currently, there are some experimental products uh, coming coming soon uh, to uh, to try to answer as most of, as possible to the users' needs. There were some surveys that were made uh, addressing the, the the needs of the of the users, the assimilators, and, uh, and many users. And we know that uh, they want um, a higher resolution along track, and they also wanted to have this. Uh, this uh, spectral information, complete in spectral information. So, uh, so, so that's uh, that. These are experimental products coming uh, coming soon. So, so here you you have an example of uh, of uh, of mixed sea area with a little bit of swell and a little bit of wind uh, from uh, from a, a model. Uh, this is from the observation. From uh, from CFOSA data, and this is uh, from Sentinel One data, which was able to see very well the swell 
but which was not able to, to see the, the wind seas, for instance. So, so now, thanks to CFOSAT, we can see the whole spectrum. And it's, uh, it's very, a very, a very valuable uh, information for, for, the, for the models. Um, you can see here a use case. You can see how it behaves. Uh, for instance, this is in New Caledonia, but you could find this in uh, any island. You can see here what we can, uh, how we read this spectra is that the, inf the swell information is coming here um, from the very large ocean and it's going, uh, it, it reaches the New Caledonia. Then the, um, the waves break uh, on, the, on the reef. And behind the island, you only have wind seas. We, you don't have swell anymore because it, it has broken uh, on the reef. And so the spectra behave like this. It's just uh, to, to, to give you an idea. Uh, the, 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 the wind, the, wind uh, the, the spectra here is, uh, has more energy in the wind direction, which is uh, the, driven by the Alizé. So uh, I'm sure in, uh, in Africa, you can also have many places uh, like this when you can observe such, uh, such uh, behaviors of the, of the waves. Uh, this is, was just another example of, the, of uh, where the satellite can observe uh, a, a long track. You, you can see this is, for instance, for one year of data. You can, the color here represents the significant wave height, so the, the, the height of the, of the waves. Uh, when, it's, uh, when it's yellow, it means that the, the waves are, 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 are strong. And then when it's blue, it means that it's very small. So here you can see that inside the lagoon, the, the waves are more generally very small, whereas they are higher uh, uh, in, in the open ocean. Uh, and uh, we are so so now the, the future of this product uh, will be in, will be the same thing with improved resolution along track. So you can see all those dots here. They are they 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 are uh, separated by uh, seven kilometers each of them. And uh, and now we we have uh, we have we have been able to compute finer resolution with only one kilometer along track. So it enables to get much closer to the, to the coast and to get inside lagoons, inside uh, 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 com complex, uh, complex shores with 20% uh, more de valid data. So, uh, so, so, so th this was also an example from, uh, from Alice uh, Delfine, who, who compared the, these results to a uh, to, to uh, model from Meteo France. And she said that uh, the, the data, um, th these data close to the shore also enable to better represent the bottom friction impact that are uh, currently not necessarily well represented by uh, most models. So uh, that was a lot about all for me. I tried not to, to get too much in the technique, but of course, if, if you have questions, I will be very glad to answer them. What you have to, 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 to know is that we are, um, we are working, working hard to improve the, the products and to make uh, something with the, the best resolution, the, the, the best, um, uh, interpretation uh, uh, as, as possible. We are working on robust and stable near real-time um, uh, wave products. We also um, try to increase the sampling. We, 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 we associate our, uh, our wave information with wind speed information because it really works together and this can be useful um, uh, for some studies. And we also are working on the description of an uncertainty because uh, like all type of measurements, satellites have some uncertainties. And so, um, and so, so we, we associate to, to the data an, an uncertainty um, for, for end users. And, uh, and also we, we, we work on a homogeneous longer term uh, wave measurements for, for climate applications. So 
all this um, all this is for for you for for the users. So if you want to to use the the data, do not hesitate to express your feedbacks on the current projects or your needs for potential future evolutions, and we'll be glad to to answer this. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. It was very interesting. Um, and thank you also for sharing the service desk uh, email address. Yeah, that's certainly um, where you should um, send your questions about the products. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, one question we will share with you. <laughs> we had other questions, but uh, this is what we have time for. Um, there's a question about, uh, do we have data for the different wave types? So I think they mean, yeah, the characterization of the yes. type of the wave. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So this this is in the um, in the in the level three uh, product. Uh, you will have uh, information about the they, they are called the partitions. So you, we can have the energy of uh, the the swell part and the the wind uh, wind part. So this is only in the demonstration product that are that will be soon. Available okay. um, from from CFUSAT, they are available on demand with uh, without uh, any problem. Uh, but uh, yes, you you have this uh, this information for for CFUSAT. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank well, you for your presentation. Um, great. And um, now this is it for uh, satellite products. Um, now we will do a break from the product and we will um, welcome um, Bashir, uh, Marwan Bashir, uh, who's going to talk to us about um, the GMES in Africa program. Um, stand, this is, stands for Global Monitoring for Environment and Security in Africa. Um, and this is actually a program co-funded by the European Commission, and uh, the goal is to adapt the Copernicus uh, program data and resources to the African context, but he's going to tell you more about it. Um, Bashir, if you're there, great. <laughs> Welcome. And Thank you very much. It's okay, yours. Let me try to share the screen. You can confirm if... Okay. Yes. Dia I can see your screen. Yes, positive mode now. Hope it's okay. Great. <laughs> it's okay? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, okay. Thank Go you ahead. very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity also to talk about the GMS and Africa. Uh, my name is Bashir. I'm a senior scientific officer uh, working uh, within the Africa Union Commission uh, and uh, dealing with uh, water and natural resources and also coastal and marine. Uh, GMS and Africa, it's uh, a program implementing the cooperation. There is a cooperation arrangement between Africa Union Commission and uh, European Commission in the area of data access and the use of uh, Sentinel data uh, of uh, the Copernicus program. Uh, the GMS and Africa program, it's a flagship program of the African Union Commission. Uh, and uh, it's come uh, through, uh, it's a product of a, a long-term collaboration, collaboration between Africa Union and the European Union on space application. And the GMS in Africa, it's a really a long, long story. It starts, let's say, since uh, 2001, since Puma, and then uh, you will see uh, MSD, MESA. We are now implementing the phase two of GMS and Africa, which will end in December uh, 2025. Uh, GMS and Africa, the process, uh, the approach we are using is really uh, to address the need of the end users. Uh, to address the need of uh, the end users, we have to start by a need assessment. And then after that, to agree on uh, some key indicators, to decide on the, which kind of data to use, and then to come with a lot of uh, methodology uh, so that we can propose to end users a tailored product 
which will uh, really address their needs. So uh, in German South Africa, this is really uh, the approach we are using because we are really targeting uh, the end users and then it's a really why it can be farmers, it can be on energy, it can be on water, it can be, it's really a wide range of uh, end users. Uh, GMS and Africa, it's really also a technical collaboration. A technical collaboration we are with our European partners, Copernicus, European Space Agency, GRC, UMESTAT, and uh, I said it uh, previously, we've also uh, at large uh, with European Union, uh, with European Commission. And this collaboration is coming uh, through the use of cloud computing platform. We have the support of uh, European Space Agency and the GRC. In terms of the service we are providing to uh, our users, this service, we are uh, also working closely with GRC uh, and the UMEDSAT. Uh, we are coming also through capacity building. Uh, we have the support of GRC and also even UMSAT. One of the key elements we are using are also uh, the e-station. And uh, we provide e-station to our consortia. And then uh, we have the support of uh, UMSAT and GRC in terms of maintenance. And then, uh, of course, uh, it was said uh, during uh, your first presentation, Andrea, because we are also promoting the use of the and access uh, to the full free and open access to Copernicus data. GMS is really uh, pushing to the use uh, of Copernicus data so that we can uh, provide services to our users. GMS, we are working we are implementing the program through consortia. In Africa, we have five regions, and the GMS is covering the five regions. You will see in Northern Africa, we have one consortia, OSS. Central Africa, we have one consortia, CITOS. Southern Africa, we have two consortia, SASCAL and CSIR. Western Africa, we have two consortia, uh, CSE and the University of Ghana. Uh, and then in Eastern Africa, we have also uh, two consortia, Ersamadi and IPA. We have eight consortia really uh, implementing uh, the GMS and Africa program. Uh, in terms of thematic, in terms of a thematic, these eight consortia are uh, implementing the program through two thematics. We have water and natural resources, and we have coastal and marine. So I will not talk uh, here uh, on water and the natural resources. I will just talk about uh, the thematic uh, on which we are talking right now, the coastal and the marine thematic. In the GMS and Africa program, we have for the phase two, two consortia implementing uh, activity on coastal and the marine. I'm very happy one of the representative, the representative are here, uh, University of Ghana and the CSR. And uh, in terms of products they are delivering uh, during the presentation, you will find more details. So it's about really monitoring and forecasting oceanography variable. And then in terms of uh, coastal and area monitoring, ship traffic and pollution monitoring, and the marine weather forecasting. So uh, when you see uh, in terms of marine, we have uh, eight uh, application uh, running uh, by uh, uh, University of Ghana and the five application running by uh, University uh, by CSR, which is located in South Africa. This is some, uh, some uh, few presentation of uh, what uh, University of Ghana is proposing, but uh, for sure, uh, our colleague Ignatius will come more in details. What you will see, you are seeing that in terms of uh, a provision of pot potential fishing zone, uh, monitoring and forecasting ocean oceanography variable and forecast uh, of ocean condition uh, to disseminate through uh, mobile app through SMS uh, alerts. In terms of services provided also by uh, the second uh, the second consortia CSR. It's really also about marine, 
marine and maritime in, in terms of ship traffic, uh, ship traffic monitoring, sea rescue, aquaculture support, fishery, uh, coral bleaching, and coastal ecosystem. So it's really to tell you uh, in terms of uh, uh, product and services on the GMS and Africa related to coastal and marine, a lot is really done by uh, the two consortia. So uh, GMS, it's uh, GMS and Africa, it's uh, a community. Within these eight consortia, we have eight job portals, which bring a huge community of users. Uh, I highlight just here the two for the for uh, University of Ghana and the CSR, but you have eight job portal fully functional, uh, bringing a huge community of user of product based on uh, uh, based on processing of uh, Copernicus uh, data. We have also, uh, in terms of community of user of practice, you have a digital learning platform. Uh, you can see few statistics because in addition to the services, in addition to the products, there is a need of capacity building. So uh, within GMS, we have a digital learning platform, which it's open, you have open, uh, it's free, courses are available. We collected courses since uh, previous program, uh, MESA, uh, GMS phase one, GMS phase two, and the course is done by our, uh, our partners, GRC, you all these courses are available in this platform and for free. You just have to log in to receive credential and to connect and to have access to whatever you have you want uh, on courses, of course, related to EU, uh, Copernicus products, and so on. In GMS and Africa, we have also another community. We have a group of EO because in terms of promotion of really the involvement of women, we have women in GMS and Africa. Uh, it's a group which is open, not closed, really to all uh, experts on EO, uh, geomatics. So it's really to talk about, to discuss, and then to contribute also in the promotion, the use of also uh, Copernicus uh, product also. Uh, the last one, we have also a, a network of academia. We have uh, actually around 28 universities all over Africa, part of this uh, network. So it's a network of academia. You have professor, you have a research center. We are relaying also on this network of academia uh, in terms of capacity building, in terms of training, in terms of, so really this community of practice uh, of user is making us uh, in terms of program, uh, a Pan-African program. So uh, in terms of community, actually GMS and Africa program is uh, really dealing with 167 institution, African institution. You have some statistics here. We are dealing, you saw the academia, we have uh, 45 academia, uh, research center, regional. The graphic is giving you a big picture, really to tell you this program is yours. It's a Pan-African program. It's uh, really promoting the use of uh, uh, Copernicus data so that uh, we can address uh, some need of the user. So this is uh, really a generic presentation of the program. We remain available uh, for a lot more details. Uh, we put here some links about the blog, or the agenda of the African Union, the agenda 2063, because GMS is implementing one of uh, some aspiration of the agenda. You have the African Space Agency. Uh, you have all link uh, to know more about this program. I thank you. Thank you very much, Pashir. That was a really nice introduction to the program and yeah, a lot to find out still. Uh, thank, thank you also for sharing the useful links. Uh, okay. That's very nice. Thank um, you very much. So we have, um, I will maybe ask you this uh, this one question. Um, okay. 
which organization portal provides the potential fishing zone advisory? Uh, CSR, we can connect uh, uh, UOG and the CSR, we can connect uh, uh, everybody with this uh, two consortia and they can provide a lot of information on that. CSR? Yeah, CSR and the University of Ghana. University UOG. of Ghana? Yes, yeah, okay. we'll have even a presentation on that. Yes, later on with Ignatius. Yes, exactly. Great. And uh, maybe I can also ask you this one. Uh, how can we access the GMES Africa portal? I don't know if you mentioned. Uh, we, can share, we can share the link right now. We can share. And uh, yeah. I think in the slide, we put all the link available. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There Your is presentation slide. will be available. Yes. yes, there is a slide more details. So we put all the link there. Great. Yeah. Yes, Great, with the you. link of Joe Portal, we will have you have the eight Joe Portal and eight. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank and you very we'll much. hear okay. a bit more about GMS from okay. Africa later on. Thank you um, very much. Okay. And um, now we will uh, continue with our products. At this time, we will pass on to our model products. Uh, and I will introduce um, Marie Trevion. She is um, head of our department uh, in evaluation uh, and oceanography systems. Um, you have to uh, correct me on that. <laughs> um, and um, she will tell us a bit more about um, physics uh, models um, from a Copernicus Marine Service. And yeah, the floor is yours, Marie, whenever you want. Thank you very much, Andrea. Yes, I'm, a, I'm head of the evaluation service. Uh, which is part of the Operational Oceanography Department at Mercator Ocean. Uh, I'll share my screen. Um, not sure. Let me know. Mm -hmm. I can see it. Um, but okay, sorry. Just in don't worry. Yeah, my... Do you see it full screen? Not yet. Right? Not yet. Yeah. I know if you put in presentation. Yeah, and then I think you can, yeah. Uh -huh. It's not yet in uh, full screen. No, I see all the slides, you see. And I think it was uh, on the top part. Yeah, basculer entre les modes, je pense. Yes, now it's full screen. Okay, good. No, sorry. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the physical products of uh, the Global Monitoring and Forecasting Center of our Marine Copernicus Service. Um, so um, this forecasting center leads a lot of activities, uh, among them ocean forecasting, using modeling and data assimilation, also coupling models, physics and biogeochemistry, for instance. We're also doing multi-model ensemble, uh, a lot of engineering activities, ocean monitoring activity, uh, ocean monitoring indicators, validation, impact studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I won't go into the details, but it's just to say that this is part of our activities. It implies um, a lot of people are working on that to produce these uh, physical uh, oceanography systems, but also biogeochemistry and waves uh, in collaboration with other. Uh, with partners. So um, here you can see that um, the Global Monitoring and Forecasting Center has a near real-time component and a reanalysis component. And uh, we are working with a lot of partners. Uh, you can see the logos here to produce phys physical, um, physical products, biogeochemical products, wave products. Uh, this is Meteo France. Uh, for both near real time and reanalysis. So this is a, a first illustration of the global high resolution near real time products. So these are uh, the surface currents that you can see on the My, My Ocean Pro viewer from the Marine Service uh, portal. So I put here the number of the product 124 and the DOI. This product is um, high resolution. We mean here for the global ocean, uh, high resolution is one twelfth of a degree. So it's approximately nine kilometers, one point every nine kilometers and 50 vertical levels. This model uh, is, the model we use is NEMO, 
uh, in its version 3.6, and the, the sea ice model is called LIM3. And we assimilate data uh, in a multivariate way. Um, in this model, uh, so we assimilate the sea surface temperature from satellite, the sea level anomalies, temperature and salinity profiles, uh, in situ profiles, including algal profile, of course, and sea ice concentrations in the sea ice model. We also perform a bias correction um, to reduce the bias in temperature and salinities. So it, it's a correction at large scales, opposed to this uh, data assimilation, mostly done at small scales. Um, seven days uh, mesoscale activity, okay? The forcing, the atmospheric forcing um, comes from ECMWF, it's the operational high resolution analysis and forecast at a one hour frequency. Um, we do an analysis, I call it a 4D ocean analysis because it, it's an analysis in space and time uh, using one week of oceanic uh, observations and we perform it uh, every Wednesday. And uh, we do forecast every day. We do a 10 day forecast. We update the forecast uh, using updated atmospheric uh, forecast and analysis and forecast. Today on the catalog, the period, uh, you can expect data starting in November 2020 uh, up, up to now. And there are daily, monthly, and hourly variables. Of course, you can find more information, detailed information in the online documentation, including all the references um, and other details on the files, of course. So this slide is just to uh, let you know about the recent update that uh, we made to this forecasting system. So it's very new. It uh, dates back from uh, uh, the end of last year. And so for those of you who have been using the previous version, uh, it's just to let you know that we made a lot of uh, updates and that gives actually nice results, but that changed a lot the, that changes a lot the, um, the viability, the day-to-day -day viability towards more realism, but it, it, it is a big change. So we have updated the version of the model and uh, that includes new numerical schemes, new tunings, etc. And from this, we get an improvement of the ocean uh, circulation and sea ice physics. We have updated the background error covariances. We use, um, we compute them from the reanalysis. So with this, we better capture uh, the information contained by uh, in the observations. Um, we have, we are now using a 4D version of the analysis. So um, this is really. Uh, uh, improving the results and the day-to-day -day time variability. Um, we are using a new mean dynamic topography, which improves the ocean circulation. And we uh, are really, um, we also have improved the bias correction at large scales uh, for temperature and salinity. So we have checked with observations that these improvements are really uh, improving the overall results and including at high frequencies. So this is the list of observations that we assimilate in the system. So uh, those who are, which are um, highlighted in light gray are assimili assimilated in the system. So with the dates uh, indicated here. So something important to know is that uh, what you have online was initiate the initial conditions of what you have online are uh, October 2016. So not everything is online, only the recent years. Uh, but uh, the initial conditions were uh, a few years earlier. So the data that we assimilate are all available on the uh, Copernicus Marine uh, portal. Some uh, other data are used uh, to really uh, better tune the data assimilation system. So now I go, um, I, I show you some uh, validation results uh, to give you an idea of the overall quality of the system. So what you see here, uh, the lower map is a root mean square difference between uh, the SST analysis Ostia 
and uh, the global analysis and the global analysis system, uh, the, the global, sorry, the Mercator global analysis and forecasting system, which is called here GLO12. So this is for one year uh, in 2019. And uh, you can see that the errors um, are really uh, below, uh, let's say, 0.3 degrees in most of the ocean. Uh, the, the errors are really located, the strong errors are really located in the very strong currents uh, and um, the western boundary currents here. Um, and if you look at the mean error, showing the biases uh, with respect to still with respect to OSTR during 2019. Here you can see some large scale differences, um, but which are still below 0.5 degrees, which is the typical error of the satellite uh, SST. So this is quite uh, satisfactory. And if we look at the at the same metrics, but in time. So the average differences, global average differences in time with respect to the different type of observations that we assimilate. So we have the um, ODSP SST in red, which is the data, the, S the SST observation that we assimilate, which is a L3 uh, product from the marine service. We can see that the error stay really below uh, the expected average error from the observation. So we are below 0.2 degrees. And also we are very close to in situ observations at the surface in orange and very close to another uh, SST uh, uh, analysis, which is Ostia in blue. And here you can see here on the slower plot in the slower diagram, the same uh, the um, root mean square errors in time, uh, and you can see that it's quite stable in time. Uh, there's a seasonal cycle linked uh, probably with sea ice here, um, but uh, apart from this, we we are very uh, happy with the results of this new system, which is closer to assimilated observations than was the previous system. This is an illustration of the quality of the surface currents. What you see on the left is a correlation. So these are uh, these bars correspond to correlations of several uh, different forecasting systems. Uh, the colors, so the, um, the dark colors are the previous system and the light colors, pink and cyan, are uh, the new systems, including a specific data set, which is the surface currents from the model, uh, to which we add a tidal component and a Stokes drift component coming from the wave model. So this allows you to have a more a complete vision of the surface current including the processes that are not directly represented in the model. So this data set is uh, shown in cyan and dark blue in the previous system. So you can see that the correlation is quite nice. Uh, it's over 0.6 in many areas of the ocean. So maybe this is uh, very small, but you, this is glo the global ocean. And there is also here the tropical Atlantic it's nearly 0.6 on the average of all the tropical Atlantic. And here on this map, what you see is the separation distance uh, in kilometers after uh, 72 hours of Lagrangian drift between um, drifters, actual drifters, uh, and virtual trajectories using the surface currents. So the maximum errors you get um, are 80 kilometers in very uh, energetic areas, which is really state of the art, uh, which are good. This is um, the expected results. So this has been checked also with independent observations, such as uh, drifter velocities. Now I switch to the multi-year products. 
uh, the global high resolution material products, so the reanalysis. I, I give you here the number 130 and the DOI. So this is a long time series of the past, starting in 93. Um, so here it is illustrated with temperature. So this system um, is slightly different uh, from the near real time system. It, see, it is um, uh, based on a, an older version of NEMO, but it has the same kind of grid, 50 vertical levels and a 1 12th of a degree uh, grid. Um, the assimilation is basically the same with a bias correction of large scale temperature salinity too, and the same type of assimilation with the same type of data. But the forcing, the atmospheric forcing is um, an atmospheric reanalysis from ECMWF, ERA and TRIM, and then ERA 5, starting from 2019, um, with a three hour frequency. So as I said, uh, we cover uh, the altimetric era starting in 93 and daily and monthly variables are available. The data assimilation also is done using a seven day windows uh, every Wednesday. So you can, you can find also more information on this uh, reanalysis in this article from Lelouch et al in Frontiers. So the DOI is here. Um, what you see on the left is uh, the validation of the long-term trends from this reanalysis. So Gloris, the, the, the sea level trend was computed uh, from Gloris 12 uh, on the lower plot and compared with the sea level, um, observed sea level, uh, regional sea level map, regional sea level trend map, sorry. So you can see that the two maps are very similar and we obtain um, very nice uh, sea level trends uh, with this three analysis. Uh, temperature and salinities are also very well reproduced and allow us to compute ocean monitoring indicators from this three analysis. Uh, but there are still uh, biases and things that we uh, improve to get better trends, um, especially for the uh, ocean depths um, and uh, some areas of the ocean which are um, which need to be uh, improved in reanalysis, for instance, uh, the southern oceans where less observations are available to constrain the reanalysis. So the improvements to come, we are going to uh, provide outputs of this reanalysis closer to real time, closer to present. Every, uh, every month, we are going to update until three months before present time. So this is going to happen at the end of 2023 uh, in, the in the next release of the Copernicus Marine Service. A new reanalysis in preparation based on the near real time system. And we are also in the process of improving a multi reanalysis product that we also uh, disseminate, which is called GREP. Uh, so that it includes um, better versions of the reanalysis and maybe this high resolution reanalysis too. So that's that's all for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Um, uh, we actually have how many questions? Uh, two questions. Two questions. Maybe we can address them both. <laughs> um, so the first one is between the wind speed uh, ex extracted from Sentinel-1 and the wind speed um, provided by CMWF winds from Copernicus Marine, what is the most accurate product? I don't know if this is <laughs> ready for you <laughs> in this case, but uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this is a, a difficult question for me to answer, but um, mm. we know that the wind products provided by uh, Copernicus Marine are uh, based on the uh, scatterometers, methods. And um, well, they are very accurate and regular, regularly compared uh, with what uh, ECMWF produces. Um, they, they, you do not get exactly the same information. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not exactly the same variable. OK, so but it's not really fair to talk about I, accuracy. 
what I know is that what we use uh, to force our systems is uh, ECMWF winds because we need other type of atmospheric forcing and we need a consistent set of variables. We need the radiation flux and the winds and the precipitations and everything to be consistent and to be interrelated. And so we use this analysis from ECMWF, which assimilates all available wind uh, observations. Uh, I'm quite sure they use the Sentinel-1 and they assimilate it. And so we know that uh, these are very high quality uh, fluxes and ones that we use to force. And we know that the wind tech products are also very uh, high quality. Mm. Okay. And very close to, to these uh, ECMWF analysis. It depends on what you want to do with this data. Mm -hmm. One field or the other, depending on what you wish to, to do. Okay. Thank you. And the second one is, uh, where can I get the Glory's 12 analysis model output? Uh, you can get the model outputs from the marine service. So if you if you if you search uh, the zero zero one zero thirty product, uh, you will um, you will have access to the full record of the Glorious twelve uh, reanalysis product. Now it will be um, interpolated on regular grids because this is uh, how the marine service works. So it's not the native files, which are the outputs of the NEMO model, but it's exactly, uh, well, the fields are exactly, the, have exactly the same content. Okay, thank you. I, think I will share the link uh, to access the data. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you already said the name of the product, so that should be easy. Thanks a lot. Um, unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions. So I'll pass on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank um, you. <laughs> bye bye. bye. Uh, so now I'll introduce you Coralie Peruch. Peruch. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> know how to pronounce this. <laughs> Peruch. <laughs> Peruch. Thank you. And uh, Coralie, she's an oceanographer also working uh, with Marie and Marine uh, teams uh, in evaluation and ocean forecasting systems. She's an oceanographer working uh, with uh, marine biogeochemistry models. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours whenever you want. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I will uh, share the, my screen. <coughs> Can you see it? It's yes, okay. I can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So, hello everyone. So, I will speak about uh, the global biogeochemical products um, from uh, Mercator Ocean. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a reanalysis and an analysis and forecast system. So, uh, uh, the, the advantage of uh, these modeling products um, is that they are 3D and continuous in time and space, and they provide many dynamically consistent variables. So, uh, here are the, the colleagues who are involved in the development of uh, the biogeochemical systems. We work on the model developments and the uh, implementation, both for the near real time system and the multi year, multi -year system. Uh, we work also on data assimilation methodologies and uh, on the wall validation process with uh, many observations. And uh, for example, uh, the, we use use the BGC Argo database. Let me start uh, with uh, the biogeochemical model PISCES. It's a model of intermediate complexity with uh, five nutrients uh, here, uh, with uh, two phytoplankton uh, generic species, uh, two zooplankton uh, species, and uh, two uh, free detritus uh, compartments. And uh, um, in both uh, phytoplankton species, we distinguish uh, the content in carbon, in chlorophyll, uh, and uh, in iron. And uh, 
uh, in uh, diatoms only, we distinguish the uh, content of uh, silicate. The ratio, uh, the rate field ratio between carbon, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus in phytoplankton and zooplankton um, are uh, kept uh, constant. And uh, on this picture, you have all the processes that are modeled in pixels in this case, uh, for example, uh, the phytoplankton uh, uptake, uh, the nitrogen fixation, uh, the grazing here, uh, the natural mortality, the remineralization, and uh, so on. And uh, on top of that, uh, there are external uh, supply of uh, nutrients from uh, rivers, uh, atmospheric deposition, so uh, dust, uh, we have also iron from uh, sediments and iron uh, from uh, sea ice. So talking now about the global systems uh, we have uh, in Mercator, we have uh, two, uh, two systems on the Marine Copernicus uh, web portal. Uh, on the left, uh, we, you have the near real time system, uh, 128, and the, on the right, the multi year uh, system, uh, 129. And it covers uh, 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 the, the, the whole period uh, 93 to uh, 2019. Uh, both systems have uh, common modules uh, for the sake of uh, homogeneity. They are indeed operating a nemo uh, biogeochemical model uh, in its uh, uh, 3.6 uh, version um, on a global quarter degree grid. They are offline uh, uh, coupled with the NEMO uh, physical model on a daily basis. But uh, there are uh, a few differences between the two systems. Uh, the near real time system is more complex so far. Uh, it is a force with a higher resolution physical model at uh, one twelfth of a degree. This physical model is coarsened uh, from a 12 to quarter degree grid. Uh, there is data assimilation uh, in the physical model. And uh, in, there is a, a, a relaxation of uh, the biogeochemical model to some nutrient climatologies on a one-year relaxation scale, allowing the biogeochemical model to develop its own seasonal and internal variability. In fact, uh, this is done to mitigate the impact of uh, the physical data assimilation that has been shown to generate an upward flux of nutrients and thus an overproduction in the tropics. And at last, the BGC uh, model, the biogeochemical model, is also constrained by this assimilation of ocean color surface data and uh, that allows uh, to uh, calculate a correction of chlorophyll and nitrate in the mixed layer. Uh, and the multi-year system on the right is forced by a non-assimilated uh, physical system and has uh, no bio biogeochemical data assimilation component yet. Uh, for the near real time system, we will switch uh, in the coming months to uh, the physical uh, products that Marie uh, mentioned before. Both systems provide uh, daily and monthly fields of chlorophyll, phytoplankton, uh, carbon biomass, nitrates, phosphate, silicates, iron, surface partial pressure of CO2, pH, primary production, and oxygen. And on top of that, the near real time system also provides uh, alkalinity and di uh, dissolved inorganic carbon uh, concentrations and 10 days, uh, 10 days of forecasts. So, so how uh, to get uh, this product? Uh, you go to the Marine Copernicus uh, uh, catalog, you, clean, you click on uh, ocean products, then you search for uh, products uh, 128 or uh, 129, uh, 128 for the near, near real time and 129 for the multi-year. 
And uh, you have then a small description of the product fe features. In the documentation tab, you have the quality information document that presents a thorough uh, assessment of uh, the product. And um, so uh, from uh, now on, I will focus on the near real time product by showing uh, some plots of the validation procedure. procedure. So here are some uh, basic, basic validation of uh, surface chlorophyll. We use uh, the, the global uh, um, ocean color product of the Copernicus catalog to assess uh, the overall climatological and large scale chlorophyll uh, distribution. Uh, on top panels, um, you have uh, the surface uh, chlorophyll uh, from model on the left and uh, uh, from uh, data from ocean color on the right. You see uh, that the agreement between the model and ocean color data is quite uh, satisfying at large scale. On bottom panels, you have the root mean square difference and the uh, log bias. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, the root mean square difference is quite satisfying in the very large area in and around uh, oligotrophic gyres. It increases in the more productive regions um, uh, in mid and high latitudes, which are more turbulent and uh, less efficiently observed by ocean color sensors. Here I show um, the quality evolution between the two last systems uh, with a Taylor diagram. Um, in fact, that kind of diagram uh, is very useful because it allows to synthesize uh, basi basic statist statistics uh, as a correlation, RMSD, standard deviations on a single plot and to compare uh, really two simulations. Here you have uh, in red the old simulation and in, in uh, green uh, the new one. We consider uh, three uh, variable, four sorry, four uh, variables: uh, the low chlorophyll uh, on uh, uh, the first uh, hundred meter layer. Uh, you, it's uh, the squares uh, with the the circles. We, you have the night rays over the the first hundred meter layer. And uh, in uh, triangles uh, up and down, uh, you have oxygen at sea surface and oxygen at uh, 300 meter depth. Uh, the reference, uh, uh, the yellow stars, star is the reference data set that the model should be as close as possible to. And uh, this uh, reference data set is uh, the BGC Argo float database that is totally independent we don't uh, assimilate it uh, in the, the model. So uh, uh, the statistics are computed at global scale and uh, over three years. We see, uh, and, uh, we see here a clear improvement in quality between the two last uh, versions of the, the simulation. So uh, at last, uh, we also monitor the quality of the system along the trajectory of each uh, BGC Argo float. Here you have uh, one example of a float that starts flowing in the Antarctic circumpolar uh, current and uh, then goes into the Agulhas current. The left uh, panels uh, correspond to the float uh, measurements and the right, right ones, ones to the model. Uh, so uh, on the top, you have nitrates and uh, bottom chlorophyll. Um, so you see that uh, the model captures well the progressive uh, change of regi reg regime in the Antarctic um, in uh, nitrate. Uh, here you, you have uh, uh, the, the, the model uh, uh, catches the, the change of uh, regime. But uh, uh, it doesn't uh, not reproduce the right uh, level of chlorophyll in the, the Antarctic. Uh, I'm sorry, in uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current. So uh, it's probably due to an inconsistency between the ocean osh color uh, observations that we assimilate and the BGC Argo dataset. After the change of regime, 
here, uh, the, the model is able to catch uh, the seasonal variability in the mixed layer. So to conclude, uh, I would say that uh, these modeling products are really interesting because they are 3D, they are continuous in space and time, and they provide uh, many consistent uh, variables. Uh, moreover, they have a wide range of applications. Um, first, uh, they are used to force uh, higher trophic levels models. Uh, you have an example uh, uh, of uh, a higher uh, uh, a higher trophic level models, the micro risk uh, uh, reanalysis that is in the Copernicus catalog, and who you have here the the concentration of uh, epipelagic micronecton. So. Um, so uh, it's a module that is uh, uh, plugged in uh, our biogeochemical model module. Uh, then our, our products uh, can be used uh, as boundary conditions for higher resolution regional models. They, they are also used to compute global indica indicators uh, like uh, pH, uh, ocean uh, uh, carbon uptake, uh, coral, coral bleaching. And uh, they are also um, uh, used to, to study the impact of, uh, uh, to, to, to really uh, uh, do uh, perform uh, research studies on the impact of marine heat waves on plankton ecosystems, for example, or to study the impact on the enzo variability, uh, etc. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Corinne. Very interesting. Um, we actually <clears throat> don't have any questions for you so far, um, but uh, I was wondering, um, you mentioned about the higher traffic levels and how you will probably include this kind of data in the future. Is there, um, is it foreseen um, like a date or is it known uh, when we will be able to inject this type of data information in our models? Uh, I, I didn't uh, get. Uh, in fact, uh, we we plug uh, the uh, we plug the the high trophic level uh, model. Uh, uh, the the high trophic level model are uh, forced by our out outputs. Oh, okay, so it's already and, used actually. Yes, and oh, okay. uh, it's a product that uh, is uh, at uh, the Copernicus catalog, and uh, it's uh, the one. Uh, uh, 33 uh, product. Mm -hmm. So, 33. Yes. It's the micro risk product that is uh, ah, yes, reference, uh, referenced here. Ah, okay. And it's a product, uh, product produced uh, by uh, CLS. Okay. So, Great. so, already in, uh, in the yeah, category. already in action, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's very interesting. <laughs> Um, okay, we actually don't have any more questions, so I guess it was very clear in your presentation. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And we will pass uh, then to our next speaker, um, which is uh, Alice, Alice Talfine, and uh, who's going to tell you about uh, wave models, and then we will conclude our presentations of products. Hello. So, hello, hello, Alice. I share my screen. Yeah, you can share your screen whenever you want. Okay, you see the slide? Yes, I can see yes. the slide and it's in presentation mode, perfect. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I am uh, Alice Delfine. I work at uh, Meteo France uh, in, the, in the web modeling. And uh, in the um, uh, global uh, web team for Copernicus Mind Service with uh, my colleague uh, Lodfi Aouf and uh, with Stefan Lochun from Mercator uh, Ocean International. And I'm going to present you the, our uh, global web model products. Uh, the, so we uh, produce every day a uh, new real time uh, web model. Um, we uh, update the uh, the data uh, twice a day, and we we go uh, up to a forecast of ten days, 
and uh, we, we, we we keep the analysis uh, in a two years of archive so you can uh, retrieve the the um, web uh, outputs of our model uh, up to two years in the past uh, we use um, a model which is called mf1 and uh, we um, mf1 has a resolution of uh, uh, 0 0.12 degrees um, and uh, we we provide the output at three hours every three hours the you have uh, the classical uh, c state parameters uh, that is to say uh, height uh, period and direction uh, for total c and also for uh, wind waves on first and second swell uh, for um, we force the, the web model thanks to winds from uh, the European Center and uh, the surface currents of the global physics model that was uh, that has been presented just uh, before. Uh, we um, in the analysis we correct the web field thanks to uh, observations. For for this assimilation, we use satellite data. They have been uh, introduced uh, um, earlier by Annabelle. Uh, we use two kinds of data. The one, the first one is the altimeters data with the L3 products. We have uh, seven altimeters uh, in near real time uh, that provides uh, the significant rewrite um, worldwide. You have here an example of uh, a, a coverage of the, this data for one day. Um, uh, we, we have the luck to have a, such a constellation of uh, satellites to, to so it permit us to have a very good coverage. And uh, we use also a second kind of, uh, second kind of data, which are uh, web spectra. Uh, Annabelle also has presented it uh, um, earlier. Uh, we use uh, spectra from Sentinel-1 and from CFO set. You have here an example of uh, a representation of uh, a spectra. You have the um, uh, wave energy distributed uh, uh, along uh, frequency and direction and permit us to, to correct uh, not only the wave height, but also the direction and the period of waves. So we have done several studies to to see the impact of uh, assimilation in our model. You have here uh, some results uh, on the impact of uh, the simulation of CFOSAT. We have uh, evaluated the impact during a, a cyclonic season in the Indian Ocean. And we have seen that uh, the, um, the error is uh, reduced uh, for, uh, by uh, 12%. And particularly for high uh, wave height, more than uh, four meters, we have a better, uh, we have a stronger impact of the assimilation. Oh, it's important to insist on the uh, forcing by uh, global currents because it changed the uh, wave feed pattern. Uh, here it's an example of um, uh, aggregate current. In uh, you have uh, at the right the surface current from the global uh, physics model, and with the very strong uh, value of current due to uh, the the global global dynamic uh, of uh, ocean, and this uh, when you have currents of more than zero point five meter per second, it it has a, a significant impact on the web web height and period, and uh, so you can retrieve the the pattern of some of the pattern of the angular current on the web field at the, at the left. And uh, so this, um, this is a, a quite uh, coarse uh, forcing because we use uh, for now uh, daily uh, current, but uh, it is, uh, we have a study that uh, it, there is a positive impact on, on a region of high current like uh, South Africa. So we have uh, done a, a general uh, study of the model quality. Uh, we have used um, uh, external uh, observation here uh, from the from the altimeters at 2 A and B. 
uh, they are not used in the uh, simulation, so we can use them to validate the model. And we have uh, uh, the scores is a, um, we have a, a bias, a mean bias, uh, mostly between 20, minus 20 and plus 20 centimeters. And the error is, the, the dispersion of error is quite good uh, in deep ocean. We have uh, only 5% uh, of dispersion of error in deep ocean. Uh, it is uh, um, expected uh, to have a better score in deep ocean than near shore. And we have 15% uh, um, of uh, error near shore uh, because the, the web process are more complex, are more complex to represent. So 15% is quite good. And uh, sometimes we, we see that we have uh, some uh, strong error uh, offshore. And uh, we know that it is often due to difficulty for the atmospheric model to good represent the, the wind. Uh, and the wind process. We have also compared to uh, in-situ observations. Uh, we have used the um, in-situ uh, network of Copernicus Marine Service. And the mean error for um, uh, significant wave height is uh, 30 centimeters. And for the peak period, it is one second. Uh, it's quite good because uh, buoys are mostly uh, located in a uh, coastal area. So, so that's are uh, quite good uh, scores. Uh, I show just uh, one case. Um, it's a situation of a uh, swell uh, coming uh, in um, Gulf of Guinea. Uh, it was in November 2021. And uh, there, there have been flooding during this event because uh, swell, uh, powerful swell arrives at the same, at the same time that uh, period of high tide. So there were, there were high sea level and also uh, uh, a swell of uh, 15 uh, seconds or more. Uh, so that's quite powerful. It, it was a swell of uh, um, less than two meters. So not maybe uh, not extreme in a wave height, but a very powerful uh, with a period of more than uh, 15 seconds. So at the right here, you have the reference. Uh, what we what have the best, it's, that is to say the analysis. Uh, it's the model output uh, just after uh, the, the, the the event, we, when we have all the, the observations available that have been assimilated in the model. So it's our reference. Um, and uh, you have, had, uh, you have uh, here the, wave height of the swell and at the right here the period of the swell. And uh, fee, four days before, uh, we have uh, this output as the model. And you see that um, there is not much, there are not much differences between uh, uh, the analysis and the forecast four days before. Uh, the, um, the height of the swell was already forecasted up to 1.6 meters. And the period um, reached the 15 seconds. Uh, so it was uh, quite the same value. And it shows that uh, uh, the, the performance of the model are quite good also uh, in forecast and, and can be uh, used uh, full to, to, to do warning system. So that's all for the uh, near real tide system. And now I will speak of uh, the, our second uh, product, which is a uh, reanalysis of uh, wave reanalysis. Uh, it's uh, quite the same system. We have the same uh, wave model, MF1, but it, uh, it is available at a crosser resolution at 20 kilometers. And we have the same uh, parameters uh, as output at every three hours. Uh, in forcing, we have the wind coming from era 5 and the um, surface currents from the global uh, analysis of physics uh, every three hours and uh, all this uh, run uh, from 1993 to 2022 and we assume uh, max um, all uh, available data from satellite from satellite during this period 
So this database is very uh, interesting to do uh, with climatology. Uh, I show you a uh, very classical um, statistics. You can uh, uh, compute um, statistics like uh, mean or percentile. You have here an example of uh, 19th percentile for uh, significant divide. So at a resolution of 20, uh, of, uh, 20 kilometers, and you can also uh, construct uh, web rules. Uh, here it's uh, an example at uh, Hawaii Island, and uh, it was possible to compare to an in situ observation. So we, we see that uh, we have a very similar uh, web rules between the buoy and the model. And we we'll also um, check uh, the capacity of the model to represent a wave extreme. Uh, yeah, it's a comparison uh, uh, in um, uh, Arctic uh, um, in Australia between um, an in situ observation of the on waveries. And um, the capacity to represent wave extreme is uh, interesting to compute uh, return value, for instance. And so, um, for I will finish with the last and ongoing developments uh, in our NRT wave model. We we assimilate uh, Sentinel six wave height uh, since uh, uh, one uh, for one year, and uh, this is the last uh, uh, altimeter, the new data that we uh, assimilate. Uh, we produce also regular scores uh, against. Uh, the L3 products, the satellite products of the WebTAC uh, uh, for of Copernicus Marine Service, and uh, they are available in the um, uh, validation dashboard on uh, the website. And so, for the future, the next future, we are going to produce uh, two new parameters: uh, maximum wave height and uh, maximum crest height. And uh, we are also going to improve, improve the spectral resolution of the model. And for the reanalysis, uh, we, it is, uh, we are preparing um, an automatic update of the reanalysis. Because if you go now, you will have data up to 2021. Uh, the data up to 2022 are really, um, are arriving very soon. And what we want to do is an automatic system to, to have a, um, an update uh, um, uh, more uh, quicker quicker than today. And in the next year, we, will, um, we are preparing a, a new version of reanalysis with a better special resolution up to uh, um, 0 0.1 degree and better bathymetry and spectral resolution, a uh, bit more data for assimilation and production of uh, the two maximum parameters. So that, that's all for me. I thank you for your attention. I don't know if uh, there is a time for questions. <laughs> I'm not so much, no. <laughs> but um, actually we, do, we didn't have any question for you as well, I think. Oh, no, sorry, we do have. And um, yes, we will address them. So I'll share just quickly my screen. If you could just stop sharing your screen, yes, uh, please. Thank you. There's always a delay with um, with these screens. And yeah, actually, we have two questions. So um, do you see my screen? Yes. With the slider? Yeah, perfect. Um, so the first one, what is the uh, Waveries model uh, coverage? Also the forecast periods. Uh, uh, it's the same coverage for both model models. They are global. And um, there are no forecasts for Waveries. The, the NRT, the model in near real time and Waveries um, uh, are, uh, concerns different uh, time coverage. The uh, NRT is for today, for just the last month on the 10 days that are in the future. And the Waveries is for the, the real past. <laughs> that means yes. uh, 30, 30 years back. Yeah, I see. Um, and the second question, uh, can we have the references for this study, flooding due to wave and tide with Copernicus data? I don't know if this was uh, something you mentioned or... Yes, it was only an example. I, I take ah, okay. it uh, from um, 
the news um, I, I have no uh, references I, we have no producer and a, a real mm -hmm. study with an article I, yeah. it was only an example I put the output of the model okay um, I, I heard of it uh, just an example uh, by uh, a normal news uh, not scientific not scientific news okay <laughs> great um, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, so now we will move on to our last presentation. Uh, Ignatius, if you're still there, <laughs> we're a bit uh, <laughs> delayed. Oh yeah, great, you are still there. <laughs> You're already sharing, perfect. So Ignatius will, um, so we now finished with the, our product uh, presentation. We will now share with you a use case and um, the floor is yours, Ignatius, whenever you want. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, my name is Ignatius, as Andrea has already introduced. I'm going to be talking about a specific use case in North and Western Africa, looking at marine data and products to support safety at sea in North and Western Africa. Um, this is being done under the GMES and Africa project um, for North and Western Africa. It's been implemented by 10 partners in Ghana, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Benin, Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt. And the scope of this project is covering 18 coastal countries in North and Western Africa. The aim of this project is to be able to provide end users and mainly policymakers with information on six main services, looking at monitoring of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, monitoring and forecasting of ocean variables, as well as forecasting ocean states, monitoring coastal variability and coastal ecosystems, as well as the very new one, which is the oil spill monitoring service. For this particular use case example, I'm going to be talking about the ocean state forecasting service. Towards the end of my presentation, I might want to touch a little bit on the other services as well, which might not necessarily um, be linked to the Copernicus Marine Service, but I'd, I'd um, focus my presentation on the ocean state forecasting service. So now in Western Northern Africa, you're going to find out that there are loads and loads of artisanal fishermen who usually go out in small dugout canoes. And in Ghana alone, you have about 10,000 of them and about roughly 120,000 in the entire West African section. These um, fishermen usually rely on traditional or local knowledge to navigate the seas, to locate fish, and also most often to determine the state of the ocean or the weather at sea. Unfortunately, some of this information is not too accurate and most of the times you end up with such unfortunate events such as fishermen going missing at sea, um, them dying in bush fishing expeditions. And in this particular case where you had eight fishermen who were part of a 20 man crew traveling from one part of Ghana to the other, for maintenance and then they are both capsized as a result of violent waves that tossed the vessel around. So this is a particular problem when it comes to the artisanal fishing sector in uh, Ghana and in West Africa as a whole. In trying to address these issues, we're utilizing a whole lot of um, Copernicus marine data, looking at regional and global ocean physics analysis products and also the global ocean wave analysis products. These particular parameters, which I've already been talked about, are combined into indices to be able to generate early warning maps, like what we are seeing on the screen now for the entire West African region. This information is particularly important to artisanal fishermen and across the length and breadth of West Africa. Also, we have a category of um, fishermen who are classified as semi-industrial. They do not really fall under um, the section or categorized under the industrial fishing fleet because they have um, vessels smaller than the industrial fishing fleet. Um, also, it is particularly important to navies and coast guards and disaster management organizations to be on the lookout for such events and to also target their rescue efforts towards certain places where it would be envisaged that um, the state of the ocean might be not necessarily calm. 
It is also a good tool for to inform decision making for artisanal fishermen because in this instance they get the information before they go out to sea. So then it determines, it gives them that um, likes to actually choose whether they want to go out to sea or not. And for the property owners, like the canoe owners, they can also decide, no, I had received this alert. I will not allow you to go out with my vessel to fish because it might lead to the damage of my property. In developing this particular service, um, all these products have been combined into simple indices, which would be able to be interpreted by the local fishermen into indices such as one, two, or three, where one represents calm, two rough, and three dangerous. And this has also been integrated with traditional knowledge where people basically would use flags to indicate the state of the ocean where red would indicate dangerous and green for calm. So in combining these two efforts, messages, simple SMS messages are sent based on the analysis of the products to these um, coastal communities. And then the leaders can plant these flags wherever they deem um, necessary. In Ghana, you can access this short code by just dialing star 920 star 88 hash on any mobile service and you receive a prompt like we are seeing over here at the top. So it gives you actually um, the forecast for the day and then a three-day additional forecast where you can select and get the simple messages to um, one, two, or three with the corresponding explanation to the message. In Nigeria, you can access it via the short code star 347 star 87 hash. And it's important to note that all these short codes are free. And once you dial them, it doesn't come with any cost to the user. So far, we have more than 10,000 unique users actually accessing this product on a daily. At the national level, it has also been integrated into um, daily forecast reports by the National Meteorological Agency. So an example is what I show here for the Meteorological Agency of Ghana, where they have actually added some extra parameters to this, including tidal waves and also most importantly visibility at sea. This is one of the leading causes of accidents at sea uh, when it has to do with fog and um, reduced visibility, especially at night. So it's also important to have such parameters. We've included extra parameters like rainfall also, which might cause certain harm to these um, fishermen because they are not protected in their small dugout canoes. We have tried to integrate as much as possible the feedback and how um, the users want to receive this information and um, any other parameters that have been um, included in it. For example, we've engaged several stakeholders, including um, canoe fisheries associations and gear owners in Ghana and other countries as well to be able to fully utilize the service. It is also available on uh, a mobile application that has been developed for both Android and iOS phones. Um, just search the key term GMESUG, and then um, you should be able to see this logo, which indicates that you're downloading the right app. This app not only gives you information on the ocean states, it gives you information on the ocean states as a map, as you see over here, as um, a text um, service where you can actually um, click on the drop down menu over here to reveal the country that you want to obtain the message from and it gives you this forecast in the three official languages in english in french and in portuguese for the app you also have information on the potential fishing zone mapping service as well um, unfortunately this is a, a particularly restricted service which um, is supposed to aim protect the fishery rather than help the fishermen actually go and get more fish there issue within Western Africa has to do with illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. So this information is usually given to the Ministry of Fisheries and any fisheries related body within the region. If you're interested in more of the service, please join our upcoming trainings on the Marine Meteorology and Safety at Sea training, which we are collaborating with the Ghana Meteorological Agency to develop and train people on, you should be able to get as much info as you want. Now to the other services um, from the previous presenters from Marine and even um, 
the particular use case example by Alice about the swells, you'd see how this marine data is being utilized in West Africa. For issues um, relating to fisheries management, we have the potential fishing zone maps, which help um, to actually police areas where we feel the probability of the occurrence of small pelagics within um, the Canary and Gulf of Guinea is high. And so we can deploy and more um, security agencies to police these particular areas. We also have the oil spill monitoring service currently running for the northern part of Africa developed by one of our partners, the diary in Egypt. And we see examples of these services on my right. Um, in the middle, we have the last product, which is the coastal um, areas monitoring product, which looks at coastal vulnerability and shoreline change across the length of Western Africa. Um, because we're out of time, I'd like to end here. If you want more information on the project, please feel free to send us an email, visit our website, our Twitter handles, and I've also added the Twitter handle for our partner in North Africa, that is NAFCOST. This is our Facebook page for any information that you want. And I'd like to end here by thanking the European Union Commission, the African Union Commission, the GMES and Africa Programme, and most importantly, the Copernicus Marine Service for making this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ignatius. That was a very inspiring uh, presentation and hopefully will uh, yeah, inspire other developments in the, within the African communities. Um, thank you. Uh, there is one question for you. Um, what is the accuracy rate of predicted ocean conditions to actual conditions? And do you have any plans in the pipeline to improve this? Thank you. Okay, so um, with the predictions we've gotten uh, in the past, trying to actually compare the accuracy with um, in-situ measurements like buoys that we had deployed in Cape Verde and also some in-situ measurements in, um, I think, off the coast of Benin. There seemed to be a very high level of agreement between two data sets. And one thing I did, measure, I did mention also is, um, like we said, we are using model products where it, it can go off once in a while. So we try as much as possible to uh, engage the various stakeholders and get the feedback on if the event actually did occur or did it not occur. So we sent you a message which indicated that the ocean state was going to be either calm or it was going to be rough. Was that your experience when you went out to see what section of the ocean did you go out to? How, is it possible to get the geographic coordinates of the locations and then we can compare and use that to tweak and improve the model. So that's how we've been going about it so far. Okay, great. And there's one question about your the training you were um, talking about. Uh, how can they um, how can they join the the, the training you were talking? Yeah, so about? I'll, I'll be sending um, sharing the links on our various social media handles. And for I already see some of the guys who had participated previously in our online training. So for those guys, they will be automatically notified. For new users, please um, look out for information on this on our website, Twitter, and Facebook pages and you'll yeah. get the updates from there. Great. And um, there's one last one. Please, what can we do to help fishermen missing uh, when they go go fishing within Africa? I don't, yeah, I think <laughs> your tool is more <laughs> prevention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. In 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 our part of the world, we say prevention is a bit better than exactly. cure. So, yeah, yeah. Before you go out, check out the information. And one thing we also like to advocate for is something that we did with our combined efforts with our um, PFZ monitoring service. Um, so, in order to be able to monitor activities happening in um, the various EEZs of the country, we planted monitoring or um, tracking devices, class B transponders on um, artisanal um, vessels, which prior to that did not have any means of monitoring their activities. So with that sort of technologies, we can only advise countries to invest in that kind of technologies because apart from the industrial vessels, there's no way to track the artisanal mm -hmm. vessels. And with these devices, in case they are in any kind of distress, they can send out messages or these devices themselves can send out a beacon to let other class B vessels equipped with class B transponders or 
um, navies or coast guards or whoever is aware, zone in on their specific positions because doing rescues on the sea, it's not like doing rescues on the land. It's very mm. difficult to navigate the very ocean. Fast. So, yeah, <laughs> yes, so with proper information on location, um, rescue efforts can be done better. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's what I have to say about that. Great. Thank you very much. And I think we will have to conclude this workshop for today. <laughs> thank you, um, too. Thank you. And um, thank you, everyone, for having participated in today's workshop and to all our speakers. Uh, I just wanted to say that tomorrow we will have our practical session. Uh, we will present you um, three practical sessions. We will have the demonstration, the live demonstration of the MyOcean Pro, and we'll have two exercises um, uh, using Jupyter Notebooks and QGIS uh, software. Um, and we hope uh, you, you will be able to participate. About um, this presentation of today and tomorrow as well, uh, all of this will be available on the Padlet and also on our YouTube channel uh, for the presentations, the PowerPoints or the actual presentations, they will also be available on the Padlet. So we are not actually able to send you directly via email. I've seen a few of those uh, questions here, but um, uh, once you access the Padlet, you will see, you will have the replays and you will have the PowerPoints, you will have access to everything. So I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well, Vincent. <laughs> yes, yes. And the last thing, I would like to thank you very much, the, the live interpreters, On Mousse and uh, Elise de Battisti, who did a, a very a great job because it's quite difficult to, 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 to follow uh, this kind of uh, specific vocabulary and uh, different accents. So thank you very much, both of you. Indeed, and, and we so, had a very dense list of speakers as well. So it was a really yeah. non-stop. Thank you, everyone, for that. And yeah, uh, yeah uh, tomorrow is demo session. So don't forget that. Huh? We will be we will have QGIS demos, Jupyter Notebook demos, and uh, viewer demos, as Andrea said. So see you tomorrow at 10. Yeah, thank Stem, you very much. Same Zoom link. Thank <laughs> you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao.